far from the bloodshed of war-torn Afghanistan, a battle is being waged in the Federal Court of Australia. While lives won't be lost in this conflict, they could well be destroyed. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch and to that other defamation trial of the century, which began amid great fanfare last Monday as the media scrum descended upon the Federal Court and in which the nation, the media and a lone federal court judge will try to answer this serious question. Hero or psychopath? The stark binary at the heart of the Ben Robert Smith case. In case you don't know, Ben Robert Smith is Australia's most decorated soldier, a war hero and a Victoria Cross recipient. But he's also a man accused by the media of war crimes and murder. And for the next nine weeks, an epic battle will be fought in court and the media to decide which of those versions wins out. For years, Ben Robert Smith risked his body for Australia in our longest war. At issue is whether he lost his soul. Are you finally relieved that it's, uh, it's your day in court? He is suing the former Fairfax newspapers for accusing him over six alleged unlawful killings in Afghanistan. Robert Smith's barrister told the court he is a man of courage, skill and decency, whose reputation has been destroyed by dishonest journalism, corrosive jealousy, cowardice and lies. Those journalists are Nick McKenzie, Chris Masters and David Rowe. And the article that kicked it off was this feature in the Age and Sydney Morning Herald, now owned by Nine, in August 2018. Beneath the bravery, the dark secrets of our most decorated soldier. It's fair to say that story, the result of a year-long investigation, was highly damaging to Ben Robert Smith, who denies any wrongdoing. Now, three years on, it'll be up to the federal court to decide what did or didn't take place on the other side of the world. As journalist and defendant Nick McKenzie says... At its core, the case is going to be a search for the truth about what happened in Afghanistan and what Ben Robert Smith VC did in Afghanistan. And last week, within minutes of taking the stand, Robert Smith, who is a Channel 7 executive, told the court how it felt to be called a murderer. It breaks my heart. It's devastating, quite frankly, he said. I spent my life fighting for my country and I did everything I possibly could to ensure I did it with honour. Nine is relying on the truth defence and says it will call 21 serving or former members of the SAS. And while Seven News is covering the trial of one of its own, we can't fault Chris Reason's reporting as he outlined Nine's defence last week. They alleged he'd committed he six killings, saying none, not a single one of the six murders were made in the heat of battle or in the fog of war. They were all, Owen said, PUC, persons under control, prisoners, and that was against the Geneva Convention. Many defamation cases are mired in shades of grey, where the meaning of a word, a sentence or a paragraph is argued over for days. But this is not one of those cases. As Nine's barrister Nicholas Owens told the court... Your Honour will be asked to choose between two diametrically opposed stories incapable of being reconciled to one another. Or, put more simply, as the Herald's Deborah Snow wrote... Everything would come down to who was lying. And that contest for truth is not only happening in the courtroom, it is also unfolding in the media. There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of white noise around. Uh, it is on the public record that Ben Robert Smith has a public relations team uh, that he's paying to, to, uh, to put stories out there in his favour. Now we can't say for sure if this is one of those stories, but its timing one day ahead of trial was certainly convenient. SAS hero Ben Robert Smith looks fighting fit during a gruelling training session ahead of battle to prove he's not a war criminal as he breaks his silence on the trial of the century. And to illustrate how fighting fit, the Daily Mail splashed 13 exclusive pics. And what did Robert Smith tell the Daily Mail? Well, after a set of, quote, one-legged push-ups, not much. I'm feeling good, mate. Looking forward to finally setting the record straight. And helping him fund his case is Seven West media boss and billionaire Kerry Stokes, whose WA paper has been rolling out coverage like this on the eve of the trial. Attacks on our son have destroyed his life. WA military heroes' parents reveal agony of war crime allegations. Given this is a proxy battle between Nine and Seven, we advise some caution when reading their respective headlines. After BRS's first day of evidence, the West Australian splashed with... VC Hero reveals heartbreak at murder claims. Contrast that with the Sydney Morning Herald. Former soldier involved in six murders, court told. And News Corp, which should be independent in this fight, also appears to be siding with the war hero, with front pages like this. 
Victim of liars and cowards. Hero, not psycho. And yesterday, the Sunday telly was pumping out what looked like pure PR with this front page splash. Big Ben's break from legal battle. Which was accompanied by a sympathetic story inside the paper with more exclusive pictures that were surely set up. Exclusive pictures. Escaping the pain of his courtroom tears. It's not contrast to that. On day one of the trial, Nine's papers had highlighted another relationship they alleged Ben Robert Smith had been having with one of his own legal team. We were surprised to learn that before 8am on Friday, the decorated soldier was spotted in running gear returning to the Sydney apartment building where Monica Allen, a media lawyer who worked on his case, normally resides. Robert Smith's lawyers denied he was in a relationship with Allen and accused Nine of engaging in a smear campaign. And outside court, Seven Executive Bruce McWilliam went on the attack. It's extremely unfair that a party to litigation would use its own organs to make slurs on solicitors who are acting against it. It's, it's close to contempt of court. Nine denies this. And while we're not adjudicating on the matter in any way, it's worth noting it was News Corp's Courier Mail which first published those friendly snaps of lawyer and client in August last year. So, with one week down and nine to go, stand by for high drama and shocking revelations of what happens in war. As defamation barrister Matt Collins wrote in The Age... In some ways, this is a war crimes trial masquerading as a defamation action, but the stakes for both sides could not be higher. It will be a compelling contest. It will indeed. But now, let's leave the courts and go down to Harvey Norman to watch the media bury bad news about Australia's biggest advertiser. And let's start with Channel 10, which is not one of the gravediggers. Retail workers have staged a noisy protest outside a Harvey Norman store in the city demanding a fair share of the company's record profits. During the worst of the COVID crisis, the retailer banked $22 million worth of federal government JobKeeper payments to help cover wages. It's claimed Chairman Jerry Harvey has refused to pay it back despite a bumper sales period. Yes, workers protesting last month and demanding a pay rise had a clear message for Australia's white goods wonder. Harvey Norman, pay back JobKeeper. Pay the workers! And naturally, their anger was noted by News Corp's wire service, whose report was syndicated across at least 16 News Corp titles, including news.com.au, The Australian, The Daily Telegraph and The Herald Sun, in a story that did not pull any punches. Angry workers have rallied outside Harvey Norman stores to protest the retailer purportedly opposing minimum wage increases as it holds on to JobKeeper benefits despite soaring profits. News Corp's story also shone the spotlight on the man who runs the show, Jerry Harvey. Harvey Norman boss Jerry Harvey, who has ranked equal 28th in the latest AFR Rich list, has for months been called on to pay back JobKeeper. But soon after publication, the entire story was quietly scrubbed clean from 12 of those 16 titles, including The Daily Telegraph, The Australian and News.com.au. And people who tried to click through to read it were confronted with this message. So, how and why could that be? Well, Harvey Norman is Australia's biggest advertiser by a country mile, spending an estimated $340 million last year, according to Nielsen Ad Intel, which is almost three times as much as the runner-up Woolies. And several shows on Sky News, owned by News Corp, are among the beneficiaries. Harvey Norman, absolutely close to our hearts, and we want you to support them because not only do they support us, they give us the opportunity to come here and do things like this. News Corp's newspapers also receive massive amounts in ad revenue every week from the retail chain, and the pandemic increased that dramatically. As Jerry boasted to Perth 6PR late last year... We decided to reinvent the newspaper. So then we, we, we have the cover, the back cover, the front cover, in the middle, every paper in Australia. And we're doing it day after day after day. And so he is. In the week of that protest, we counted 163 full-page ads from Harvey Norman and Associated Brands in the News Corp Metro papers. So... We asked News Corp whether the bad news story had been taken down from their sites to avoid offending their benefactor. To our surprise, we have not heard back. But News Corp is not the only one to give Australia's biggest advertiser an easy ride. Back in February, when the company first refused to pay back millions in JobKeeper payments, 
Seven News' 6pm bulletin simply ignored the story and gave Harvey Norman this free plug instead. Hey, Harvey Norman. They've been in our homes for almost 40 years. Now the retail giant has just posted its best result ever. And Triple M Adelaide has also gone soft on Harvey Norman, as we showed you last year, when Choice magazine gave the company a shonky award. We also have Harvey Norman now. This is an interesting Ooh, one, because we... we <laughs> careful, they're a sponsor of Triple M. And when we ping the radio station for its dodgy coverage, the hosts even fessed up. Now, Mr Paul Barry of Media Watch, are you suggesting that I can be bought? You are 100% correct. <laughs> you bloody bet I can. <laughs> you pay our wages. You and don't expect the fawning to stop. When Jerry Harvey talked about his newspaper ads on 6PR, Steve and Baz were quick to make sure that radio's favours should not be forgotten. Well, radio's always been great for you, though, Jerry, and remember that uh, here on 6PR. Well, we love your ads. Well. And, uh, no, 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 but radio, we're staying with radio. I know we're you not, are. I know and, you are. And I tell you, well, we've, we've been at the biggest, one of the biggest supporters of radio. Oh, no risk. Ever since. Jerry, going we... Going back so long. Based on that, we hope you live to 200. Now, good on Jerry and Harvey Norman for helping to keep Australia's media solvent, but is their money now so important that some are too scared to criticise? We contacted Jerry's office several times to ask him that question, but he did not respond. The ABC is obviously one media organisation he is not interested in. But now, to another big spender, Clive Palmer, and another much briefer media bonanza that ended because it was built on a lie. Advertisements funded by Clive Palmer, which falsely claimed COVID vaccinations has caused hundreds of deaths, have been pulled from the airwaves. So, did Clive Palmer really say that vaccines have killed hundreds of people? Well, judge the ad for yourself. Australia has had one COVID-19 associated death in 2021. But the TGA reports there have been 210 deaths and over 24,000 adverse reactions after COVID vaccinations. Authorised by Clive Palmer Brisbane. Now, we don't know how many people heard those ads, but they ran on stations owned by Grant Broadcasters, which has 52 commercial licences across every state and territory in the country. And we do know that's an awful lot of ears. And what they heard, of course, is wildly out of context and downright dangerous. As John Laws put it to Palmer last Monday... I've had a look at the TGA report, uh, and uh, you're not really wrong with your statistics, but you completely misrepresented them. And, yeah, and I don't think you, you understood them in context, did you? That's right. Deaths that happen after the vaccine are not deaths that happen because of the vaccine, which as of today number just two. But don't try telling that to Clive Palmer. I think that that's the number of people that have died, John. I think that's the important thing. The supposition of whether they would have died or they're old people, I don't think it's really relevant, um, personally. But, as any reasonable listener would know, it is very much relevant. Something Laws, to his credit, kept coming back to. Only Palmer wasn't listening. Tell me this, uh, do you really believe that our population is in jeopardy? Yeah, I do. I certainly think that it's certainly in jeopardy, those 210 families that no longer have a family member. Yes, it was crazy stuff. But at least Laws was trying to set the record straight. Unlike those ads which caused the Therapeutic Goods Administration to write to Palmer and Grant Broadcasters expressing concern that... Such misinformation in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic poses an unacceptable threat to the health of Australians. So, did the regulators get rid of Palmer's misleading ads? Well, no. Because as Radio Today reported, they have no power to do so. Commercial Radio Australia, for example, told us in an email... CRA has no role in regulating the content of political ads such as this. And Ad Standards had a similar message, telling MediaWatch they are... Not able to consider complaints about truth and accuracy in political advertisements or statements about social or political issues. And the TGA also has no power in a case like this because it only regulates ads for goods and services and Clive Palmer was not promoting a product. So in the end, the ads only disappeared because Grant Broadcasters volunteered to pull them down in response to public outcry. Although it did admit... We are grateful to the TGA for stepping up to provide a clear statement of the federal government's position on this type of political advertising. The advertisements are no longer running across our network. And why does it matter that ads like Palmer's can't be shut down by the regulators? In this case, because they'll stop Australians, a third of whom are still reluctant to get the vaccine, from having a jab that could make us all much safer. And the lesson learned? 
People power, it seems, is the only way to stop political mavericks putting lives in danger. And finally, to one of the more excruciating moments that we've seen in TV news. Hi, Jeffrey. Hello, Alison. It's been a while. It has been a while, indeed. I feel like we should address um, what's happened in the months since we've seen you, since some of our viewers may not know what has happened. That is CNN's chief legal analyst, Jeffrey Tubin, making his return to the network last week. So, what did happen that kept Jeffrey in hiding for the last seven months? Well, you probably remember this. Jeffrey Tubin was suspended by The New Yorker and took a leave of absence from CNN after co-workers reportedly said that during a Zoom conference, he was, well, masturbating. Yes, after becoming a global punchline, Tubin has taken his first tentative steps back into the newsroom. But not before his employer made him atone for his mortifying sin. What the hell were you thinking? Well, obviously, uh, I wasn't thinking very well or very much. Yes, the road to redemption for Tubin was to say sorry a lot and vow to be better. I have spent the seven subsequent months, miserable months in my life, I can certainly confess, um, trying to be a better person. I am trying to become the kind of person that people can trust again. I have tried, and I'm trying now, to say how sorry I am. It was wrong, it was stupid, and I'm trying to be a better person. And then, finally, a new and enlightened Jeffrey was allowed to get back to work. Should we move on to the news? <laughs> sure, let's go. And that's all from us tonight. There's more on our website, including statements from the TGA and Grant Broadcasters. And don't forget Media Bytes every Thursday online. But for now, until next week, goodbye.